Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to open the UNEC second forum of mayors. Please note that we will start the meeting with opening statements and keynote speeches. We will then move to the adoption of the agenda. So I, I would also ask everyone to wear masks. This is a request and a condition for taking part in this meeting. Now it's my pleasure to invite Ms. Tatiana Vallovaya, Director General of United Nations Office at Geneva. Ms. Vallovaya, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Excellencies, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all today to the Palais de Nation. Let me first of all, thank the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe and its executive secretary, Ms. Olga Gayerova, for organizing this second forum of mayors under the theme, recovering from COVID-19 while advancing the implementation of the SDGs. Our world is rapidly urbanizing with more than 50% of the world population living in urban areas. This number is projected to grow to almost 70% by 2050. Cities and their leaders play a crucial role in the realization of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, from eradication of poverty and inequalities to achieving economic prosperity and promoting peace. Two years since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, the attention is increasingly shifting towards mitigation of its diverse impacts and economic recovery. The COVID-19 pandemic has slowed and in some cases revert hard-won progress towards the achievement of the sustainable development goals. The global economic downturn has resulted in the loss of 255 million jobs and has severely affected the 1.6 billion people working in the informal economy without social security or health coverage. The resulting increase in global poverty has triggered an increase in child labor and further deepened gender inequality. Some 1.6 billion students were out of school at the heart of the pandemic and an additional 100 million children fell below the minimal reading proficiency level. If we turn to the goal 11 on sustainable cities and communities, we have to state that one out of eight people in the world live now in slums without access to running water, sanitation, hygiene, and waste management services. Since the world population is growing fast, mostly in urbanized areas, it is city leaders who have to become the front runners of sustainable, low carbon and resilient future. Ladies and gentlemen, the first forum of mayors organized at the Palais de Nation in the midst of the pandemic enabled city leaders from 39 countries of the UNEC region to share concrete actions and propose innovative solutions on city resilience with a specific focus on COVID-19 response and climate change. The forum resulted in the adoption of the Geneva Declaration of Mayors, in which mayors committed to strengthen the resilience of their cities, make them greener, ensure sustainable urban transport and affordable housing for all, as well as to make their cities more equitable and inclusive. The first forum of mayors constituted a unique international platform to concretely strengthen the links between the states, cities, the United Nations entities, and other stakeholders. Two years on, we have another opportunity to build on the existing partnerships and foster new ones to address the global challenges with a renewed energy. The potential of the Forum of Mass extends far beyond the UNICE region. I am convinced that its outcomes will contribute to the global vision of the future of cities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Valovaya, and uh, thank you for highlighting the need to address the biggest challenges that we are faced 
And now I give, uh, I have the honor and the pleasure to give the floor to Ms. Olga Algayerova, UNEC's Executive Secretary. Excellencies, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear Norman, dear Sami, dear Tatiana, dear Doris, dear Jean, Madam Rapporteur, I'm very happy to have and see the representatives of the cities here. It's also my honor to welcome you all at the UNEC Second Forum of Mayors. It is heartwarming to see many of you join us in person or we have many persons also joined online. You are helping to realize the UN Secretary General's vision of a stronger, more networked and inclusive multilateral system anchored within the United Nations by supporting city to city collaboration. One that is anchored and in a shared forward looking vision and a common aspirations set out in the Geneva Declaration of Mayors. Over the past three years, you have made a marked contribution to our understanding of the complex issues facing cities, as well cities' important role in fashioning people-oriented, people-centered, creative local solutions to the global challenges of today's world. The range of topics to be discussed this year reflects your determination to make a difference at the national, regional, and global level. The basic elements that are needed for a new and inclusive multilateralism. Dear guests, cities have always been at the forefront of the response of emerging as well as long lasting economic and social challenges. This was never more evident than since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, when many of you designed and implemented innovative solutions to protect your citizens while maintaining key public services running and inventing new ones. There is no more compelling measure of the scale of the challenges and the urgency for a new multilateralism than the present Ukrainian crisis. I'm very concerned that the negative economic impacts of the conflict in Ukraine and the shrinking policy space in our region will have detrimental consequences on the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. UNEC published last week its yearly SDG progress report for the region, which showed that progress since 2020 has been too slow with the negative effects of the COVID-19 pandemic not yet fully reflected in the available data and the impact of the war in Ukraine still to be assessed, the risk that the region will fail on the 2030 agenda has never been so high. Again, the risk has never been so high. So this is why we are also sitting here. Well, how do we do that? The peace must be restored. There cannot be sustainable development without peace, and peace will not be assured without sustainable development. I really hope that the diplomatic negotiations will very soon put an end to this conflict. As we have seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, cities across the region and beyond exchange best practices and learn from each other to address common issues. This demonstrates the depth of the connections between the cities. So, ladies and gentlemen, we count on you to lead the way in strengthening these connections, improving the resilience of the UNEC cities, addressing the long-term social, economic, and environmental needs of your cities, and finding local solutions to global challenges. You are a shining example of the new multilateralism. Your dedication and creativity are needed more than ever to rise to the immediate and long-term challenges facing UNEC cities and beyond. The joint initiatives and actions you undertake in your own communities are indispensable. And UNEC stays committed to supporting your every step of the way. To 
conclude, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a successful forum. Look forward to the outcome of your deliberations and back to Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Algayerova, for your very strong messages that you delivered through your opening speech. Now I give the floor to Ms. May, uh, Maimuna Mohat Sharif, Executive Director of UN Habitat. But I understand is online. Thank you so much, uh, Madam uh, Doris uh, and Donnie, Chair of UNECE Committee on Urban Development, Housing and Land Management. Madam Tatiana Valovaya, Director General of UNOX. Madam Olga Agaya Rova, UNECE Executive Secretary. Honorable Sami Khanan, Deputy Mayor of Geneva, Switzerland, Excellencies. Honorable mayors, honorable guests, and distinguished delegates, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Thank you for the kind invitation to address this second forum of mayors. Excellencies, this year, 2022, the stars are aligned for sustainable urban development. As we open this second forum of mayors, we commence a journey which takes, which next takes us to the high level meeting of the General Assembly on the new urban agenda on the 28th April in New York. In June, we will return to this region for the 11th session of the World Urban Forum in Katowice, Poland. Although the journey will of course continue beyond, we cannot afford to miss the opportunity of these three events. We need to stress the importance of sustainable urban development. Many of you will be with us on this journey. UNECE under the leadership of the Executive Secretary and my dear sister, Madam Olga, is one of our main traveling partners. Madam Executive Secretary, as we continue our journey to the high level meeting, we are pleased to rely on your support and the coordinating role in combining inputs from all regional commission to the high level meeting. We also commend your contribution to the other processes such as the UN Secretary General Task Force on the Future of Cities. I value your deepening relationship with UNECE, not only from the policy perspective, but also with an increasing joint project portfolio. We, take, tackle, we can tackle many of the important issues such as climate change, housing, human rights, and gender inequities, and access to basic services. Especially important is the work we have been doing together on the voluntary local reviews of VLR and the Housing 2030 Initiative. The Forum of Mayors has aroused significant interest globally, and we are pleased to contribute to its further development and the significant contribution it makes in the role of cities and multilateralism. It promotes solidarity, provides a common position and enable the sharing of experience and a much needed platform to seek the solution to our most pressing problem. To my dear colleagues, our mayors and city leaders, your work is now more important than ever as we face the multiple and overlapping challenges posed by the global pandemic, a rapidly worsening climate crisis and conflicts in this region and around the world. In many communities, we are seeing level of poverty, inequity and exclusion that we have not witnessed in decades. Sadly, it is always the most vulnerable women and children who suffer the greatest burden. We need integrated approach towards sustainable development, which means the role of mayors is very crucial to implement the national development policy and plans at the local level or localization of the SDG is of utmost importance now. As city leaders, you are on the front line, often balancing between the needs of an immediate crisis response while at the same time maintaining fragile local economies with increasing demands on housing and basic services. You have demonstrated 
and impressive spirit and solidarity and many of the communities that who you support feel secure in the knowledge that under your leadership cities can become more sustainable inclusive resilient and safer UN Habitat is proud to accompany you on this journey and please know that you can count on us ladies and gentlemen in conclusion I wish you all an excellent meeting today and look forward to working with all of you to achieve a better urban future for all. Thank you so much. I pass back the floor to you, Madam Moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sharif, on your opening speech and uh, the um, continuous um, support to the work of uh, our committee and um, you, uh, UN Habitat has been since long time our uh, one of our main partners in uh, developing our program of work. Now I give the floor to Ms. Sami Kanan, Deputy Mayor of uh, Geneva. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Madam Director General of the United Nations Office in Geneva, Madam Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, Madam Executive Director of UN Habitat, Special Envoy of the UN Secretary General on, for Road Safety, Madam Chair, in my capacity as the representative of the City of Geneva and the President of Geneva Citizens, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to wish you all a very warm welcome to Geneva and at the same time to this second Forum of Mayors organized by the Economic Commission for Europe. It is a privilege for Geneva to host an event which brings together the local officials of our region and beyond in order to discuss the necessary progress to achieve sustainable development goals in a world shaken by COVID-19. I'd like to thank you and you, ECE and the member states for having gathered us here today and tomorrow for this forum. And the Geneva Cities Hub that I chair is honored to be a key partner to this event. The Forum of Mayors is unique. It makes it possible to take into account the perspective and experience of local officials and to offer them the possibility to be heard in the multilateral framework of the United Nations. This forum embodies the determination of the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, to guide the United Nations towards a modern, inclusive multilateralism in particular in far as cities and regional local authorities are concerned. Now that geopolitical tensions are at their highest and multilateralism is undermined, it is important for UNECE to remain an open space of dialogue for the European continent, as was shown in the past. I'd like to express the wish that this forum may, over the long term, strengthen and based and broadened this space of dialogue at several levels, in particular between the mayors themselves, but also with the states and with the UN. Ladies and gentlemen, the major challenges are too significant today, too numerous and too complex, and they have repercussions for many areas to be the, within the only responsibility of the, of the states. Mayors are in the forefront to manage the impact of crisis at the local level. We saw this with the COVID-19 pandemic, a global problem that each mayor had to deal with through health infrastructure, transport infrastructure, housing, economic measures, education, and measures for the population, particularly for the most vulnerable groups. Furthermore, although climate change is a global phenomenon, it does it has an impact at the local level. Many measures have been taken and are taken by may mayors to better isolate buildings, support mobility, encourage the population to change their consumption habits, to make cities greener while better encouraging and mitigating rather the social inequalities that are resulting from these phenomena cities 
and the authorities are closest to the inhabitants and they are best placed to respond to their needs in case of disasters and conflict. We see this very clearly in Ukraine and other contexts of conflict. Today, Ukrainian cities are victims of unacceptable and destructive phenomena. More broadly, cities throughout the world and throughout various areas are always in the forefront to suffer the violence of conflicts that undermine humanity. Local authorities are called upon to inform and protect civilian population best as best they can. And they are the same authorities that will soon, I hope, need to reconcile, reconstruct and give back home by re-establishing the necessary dialogue between peoples. International Geneva must remain a space of dialogue by involving non-state actors and local governments in order to bring reason back to us around the human rights and international law. All this is not new in itself, and our expertise and our ability to unite actors and pertinent stakeholders to develop solutions are acquiring greater importance in a very urban world. It is in order to assist this profound movement that the city of Geneva, the canton of Geneva and the Swiss Confederation created the Geneva Cities Hub. Its aim is to encourage dialogue and cooperation between cities, their networks, states, and international organizations. To this end, the Geneva Cities Hub highlights and gives importance to local authorities and their solutions to global challenges in order to show their relevance and their added value at the international level, in particular in multilateral processes. The Mayor's Action Platform has also been set up in order to facilitate the exchange of urban practices. I encourage you to sign up to it. Therefore. To conclude, I would like to stress the fact that multilateralism has fundamentally changed since the creation of the United Nations. It will continue to develop, to integrate more stakeholders like this forum of mayors. I hope that other initiatives will complement this multilateral scenery, which is more inclusive, in order to ensure that the debates and decisions that take place on the, at the International Geneva best reflect the various aspirations that our societies are made of. I wish you a very fruitful discussion and hope to see you at the next forum of mayors. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Kanan, and uh, thank you to Geneva City Hub for being um, such a supportive um, partner to, to this form of mayor. Now, I have a great pleasure to invite, um, we, we go now to the keynote speeches, and I have a great pleasure to invite architect Lord Norman Foster, which is also a friend of the form of mayors to deliver a keynote speech. Uh, please, uh, architect, um, you you can have your speech from the podium, lecture podium. Your Excellencies, Mayors, Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, good morning. It's a great privilege to be here for the second Forum of Mayors. The last time I was here was October 2020, 18 months ago. Um, and um, I think it's a, a really wonderful United Nations, very powerful uh, initiative. Um, if I think back to that time, 18 months ago, I remember being asked many times, is this the pandemic? Is this the end of the city as we know it? And I remember saying amongst others that I believe passionately that historically cities always bounce back stronger from crises. They continue to be the drivers of wealth of opportunity of diversity, innovation and liberation. And that any pandemic historically always had the effect of magnifying trends that were already evident. Well, we're not there yet, but for me, all the evidence is that cities are bouncing back. 
and they're struggling, some of them, in the wake of the pandemic, and others that I visit seem even livelier than before in terms of their outdoor life, their cultural life, their nightlife. So I think the big picture in the arc of history is that cities are well on the way to, to recovery. What has happened in that 18 months since I was last here? Well, the planet has grown its population. In that period, there are another 143 million, and probably most of those migrated into, into cities. Um, uh, just to put that in perspective, that's around 16 times a Switzerland, like 16 more Switzerlands. So that gives a feel for the urban challenges that cities and you, their mayors, face. In that 18 months, there's been a migration also of refugees. 5.6 million and 4 million of those from Ukraine. One-tenth of the population of that country. And probably half of them children. We can't imagine, can't begin to imagine what that statistic means in terms of human suffering and strife. And as I follow the media, I re repeatedly currently come across references to the mayors. I know two articles which are the mayors of Ukraine. And, um, and those individuals have transcended politics. They've become the voice, their, their courage, their fortitude. Uh, I salute them. I pay tribute to them for, uh, for their extraordinary efforts, uh, more than figureheads on behalf of their, their communities. And it's perhaps a reminder that in the dark days when I grew up as a, as a child, uh, in 1943, at the height of World War II, London, the government, was creating, commissioning a master plan. This was two years before the end of the war. A master plan for reconstruction and growth. And that was a symbol of optimism, of confidence in the future for younger generations, uh, as well as those who would return after the war. And, um, and the benefits of that plan are still felt today. And interestingly, by a coincidence, in the worst of the pandemic in 2020, London recommissioned its plan for the next 25 years, looking ahead. And that is a reminder of the importance for mayors of all cities of the importance of a master plan. And a master plan, the big picture for the future, for future generations of sustainable cities is measured in decades because it involves infrastructure, the physical infrastructure of roads, of connections, uh, and those are not short term. Uh, a master plan will determine the very DNA of that city in the future. Will it be compact? Will it be sustainable, encouraging, pedestrian friendly? Or will it be unsustainably, mindlessly just sprawling into the countryside around it, consuming that countryside um, and adding to energy loads and, uh, and social exclusion? So those are kind of big picture, and they address major policy issues of water, energy, recycling, waste, urban farming, for example, transportation, public or private, land use, public space, parks, greenery, education, housing, biodiversity, sport, totally inclusive. And if I had to 
sum up as I move around the cities, those cities which are vibrant have addressed the issues of urban infrastructure, of culture, education, health, and integrated high quality affordable housing. And I think the, the a master plan, if you think about it, is rooted in today with an awareness of the past, the importance of heritage, of history, connection with the past, but looking into a future which is unknown. Um, and when I talk about quality, it's very important to remember that quality is an attitude of mind. It's not about how much money you spend, it's how wisely you spend it. So a master plan would bring together those locals who know their place, together with outsiders in a holistic approach, in a quest for the best for future generations. If that is the big picture, then the shorter picture is something called urban design, which sounds very grand, but it's really about the nature of the places within a city and a reminder that the city is three dimensional, it's physical. It's not about pieces of paper and, and, and zoning. And very small changes can make massive differences to the quality of life in a city. Perhaps an obvious example at the moment is one of the effects of less demand for space for vehicles has created more space for citizens, for walking, for parks. And, uh, and we're seeing we're on the edge of big changes where younger generations, if I think of my own children, they're less interested in ownership of a vehicle. They embrace the idea of mobility as a service, uh, calling a ride when they, when they need one. And if you think of the prospect of driverless cars, it's going to be less use of, of roads. Those trends have been with us for quite a long time now. Um, and we tend to forget we see the individual cases a big dig so-called in boston where a highway from the 1960s is rooted up put underground parks uh, madrid has the rio project which uprooted an old 60s highway the same thing in the middle of Seoul. all of these created greenery reduced crime rates enhanced values and improve the quality of life for the citizens of those cities. These are big examples, but small ones. If I think of my own experience some decades back of closing one side of Trafalgar Square in central London, everybody's forgotten it now. It was a horrible, noisy roundabout. It's now a living room for London. You have symphony concerts in the open air, you have circuses, um, and I could say the same story for Marseille, where reducing the traffic gives way to a new cafe life, connects the old port with the, with the city. And then in the, in the Bronx, the Bronx River, uh, a long-term project where simply by taking away abandoned cars, invasive uh, planting, garbage, uh, now beavers have come back 200 years ago, there were beavers there. Now they've returned to the city, a wonderful example of biodiversity. What has changed? The public attitude in, in, in my experience, all the examples that I've talked about, they took years of discussion and debate. In, in my view, the the, the, the public is much more open to, to change. And I think that's a great opportunity for cities and you, their civic leaders, uh, to create plazas, um, to create avenues of trees, parks, and trees not only beautify, remember that they absorb the carbon dioxide. They're a, a powerful move to, uh, to sustainability. But sustainability really 
comes back to energy, the big issue of energy. And if we think for a moment about the new revolution, every time I open a newspaper, I hear about electrification, the electric car. But remember that the battery in an American, in, in, an, in an electric car is a fuel tank, it's a storage unit. It's very heavy, so an electric car is twice the weight of a conventional car today. Um, but when you fill it with electricity, remember that that electricity has to be made before it's pumped into the battery. And at the moment, more than 80% of our energy is fossil fuel based. So if that electricity is not clean electricity, then the electric vehicle is not a clean vehicle, which brings us back to the importance of all of the forms of, of energy. We have to be inclusive. We have to look at all the forms of, of, of energy. So really coming to the, to the end of, uh, of, of sharing some of these insights and hopes, uh, what is my hope for this forum of mayors? I think it's an absolutely unique opportunity. And I think only the United Nations could perform this task because the future of humanity, the very future of our society, it's cities. And you are the civic leaders and those who come after you. So you have this wonderful opportunity to literally shape the world of the future for future generations. I think that's a tremendous opportunity and celebration. So my hope is that when we have the third forum of mayors, that all of the mayors from all of the countries will come together, will create this extraordinary network, this sharing. Cities learn from each other in the quest for excellence and the quest for sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Lord, uh, Lord Foster. It was, uh, as, uh, as expected, very interesting, inspiring, full of hope. Now, I understand that the Secretariat and UEFA have prepared a surprise for you to show their appreciation for the beautiful logo that you have designed, but also for being the friend of uh, Forum of Mayors and for uh, uh, supporting also and uh, uh, making alive the, the regional action plan with your sketches. So, yeah, please. C and UFN are teaming up to tackle environmental, social, and economical challenges. And we are delighted, uh, Lord Forster, to sign you up in our football team. <laughs> this, is, this is your jersey. The crest, the crest of the UFI UNC team is your logo that you designed, <laughs> right? And, yes, and for your inspiration and leadership, we'd like you to be our captain. This is the captain armband <laughs> of the team. So, Lord Forster, you have one year to train, <laughs> and we can uh, you can show your football skills uh, next year when we have a chance to play football. Fantastic! Thank you very much. Thank you. I will wear it with pride. I will aspire to your ambitions, <laughs> and I will communicate these messages when I have the opportunity at the end of this month, on your behalf, uh, to address the General Assembly of the United Nations in New York. So thank you so much. Very good. And, and if I could just add that at uh, 1.15, we're going to hold a, a side event where we're going to talk about how UFA plans to join forces with UNC to work together to make the world a better place. We will talk about women in football. We'll talk about sustainability. And we'll talk about how close we intend to work with the host, uh, city hosting our events. Fantastic. Thank you very much. We hope to see you there. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I think that there is another surprise, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> Director General of UNOG has also a surprise for Lord Foster. Lord Foster, we have prepared also a surprise. This is a book about 
Palais des Nations. The, this is a historical and heritage place. And each time I say that when I walk around the Palais des Nations, I'm thinking about our ancestors who more than 100 years ago have created the first multilateral organization, League of Nations, and decided to give this organization a fantastic palace. Just think about the Second World War, about pandemic. The member states decided to invest into the future of the multilateral system. So that's an inspiration for us, because when we are living today, when we are really facing all these challenges, climate change, uh, geopolitical tensions, wars, poverty, inequality, we really have to feel that multilateralism is the solution to meet all these challenges. And I hope this book will be inspiration for your future projects as well. Oh, uh, thank you. I, I know it will be an inspiration. I get a, an inspirational charge every time I come here. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I now invite Mr. Jean Todt, UN Special Envoy, uh, road, road Safety, to deliver a keynote speech. And I would also kindly ask to keep uh, timing because we are running out of time for the moment. So please, the floor is yours. Dear UNOJ, Director General Tatiana Valuaya, dear UNEC, Executive Secretary Olga Elgayorva, dear UN Habitat Executive Secretary Maimouna Sharif, dear Mayor of Geneva, Sami Kanan, dear Rapporteur Judan Lee, dear Chair Doris Andoni, dear Norman Foster, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen. I envision cities to be a thriving space when we are reaching opportunities, essential services, and long are seamless, connected, and safe. I envision cities to be lush, vibrant, and active, where walking, cycling, and green mobility are of the core of movement. Cities where technology is used to build infrastructure that accommodates natural movement of citizens rather than infrastructure that is imposing. One where mobility does not compromise the environment, by, but rather enables it benefits. How can we achieve this vision for our cities? We can achieve it by recognizing that the demand for mobility need to be met in creative ways. We saw this demand prevail during COVID-19 where essential services and goods were only possible with agile transport systems within and between cities. We can achieve it by appreciating that movement is a habit of cities and by making it a collective duty to ensure that the heart is safe, healthy, and sustainable. If we do not actively invest in ensuring that mobility in cities functions effectively and efficiently, it can have a devastating impact. A successful city is one that results in a vision zero, zero crashes, zero harmful emissions, zero congestions, zero cost loss to, to mobility related injuries. Every minute, one person dies in city traffic. Road injuries are the first cause of fatalities for our use. Among people killed on city streets, eight or 10 are pedestrian, cyclists, and other vulnerable road users. When we speak about the environment, it is estimated that traffic congestions can cost cities such as Cairo as much as 4% of their national GDP. Currently, the transport sectors contribute to roughly one quarter of energy-related greenhouse gas emission. This is not the type of city or mobility that we envision for today, nor for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, the good news is that there are simple solutions that cities can implement immediately to move towards our vision. Some of your cities already have it. 
And I will give you two examples. Implementing temporary or permanent secure blocks or carefree areas that promote walking and cycling. In Basque Country, Spain, 45 streets were modified to close off for only pedestrian and cyclists, except for emergency and logistic vehicles. Trams were added and priority was given to pedestrians. It cost the Spanish government 5 million euros. There was a marked decrease in CO2 and noise emissions, car flow reduced and acceptance by citizens who had high at a rating of 7.4 out of 10. Similar non-motorized transport policies are seen in countries like Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Kenya. We see an increasing effort around the world to build sidewalks and cycle paths along new roads to hold car-free days and pedestrian center initiatives such as with Nairobi's pedestrian street and Kigali's increased pedestrian and cycling paths. Effectively, implementing this can include promoting electric micromobility schemes and using technology to identify foot and cycle flows so that we are investing in the most useful walking and cycling routes. Addressing high speed is essential to saving lives, building inclusive urban spaces and managing traffic in cities. There is an international movement, Streets for Life, that is calling for all cities to implement 30 kph or 20 miles by hour limits, especially around schools and high pedestrian flow. A person is about five times less likely to be fatally injured if hit at 30 kilometers an hour than at 50 kilometers an hour. Low speed streets that enable children, elderly, and others to walk or cycle can reduce private car ridership, contribute to less congested cities, and are more inclusive. And these policies are popular. In UK surveys, 70% of motorists say that they agree that 20 miles per hour is the right limit for streets where people live. Surveys in Scotland suggest 65% are in favor and one in four people see that it will make them more likely to walk or cycle in their everyday life. Evidence also suggests rapid acceptance of low speed streets across Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, dear mayors, we need your commitment. Half of the 1.3 million annual global road deaths happen in cities, half of it. To reach our ambitious targets to half road deaths and injuries and provide access to safe, affordable and sustainable transport to all by 2030, we need urgent action in cities. This year is a momentum year for road safety as the first UN high level meeting for road safety, which is expected to take place in New York next summer. I call on you to join us there and announce the solid actions that you will take to ensure that the heartbeat the movement in your city are green, sustainable, and safe. I wish you a great confidence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Todd, for your um, keynote speech and for the messages that you delivered. Uh, for sure that it will be taken into account by our uh, forum of mayors. Uh, now, we are, uh, and I'd like to thank all the uh, speakers of this panel, of the opening, and all, also the keynote speakers. And now we, yeah, we, we, we have to change the panel. So I'd ask kindly the panelists to, to move. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, meanwhile, I'd like to uh, go to this, uh, to the adoption of the agenda. But before that, uh, now I is my honor to call to order the UNEC second form of mayors, which constitutes part one of the committee of uh, on urban development, housing and land, man land management, eighty third session. This year, the form is bringing together over 
450, almost 500 participants from across the UNEC region and beyond, including around 200 participants that are, in, uh, are taking part in person. This gathering is a measure of your commitment to rise to the multiple challenges facing the region. In-person cities are seated in the front row, followed by member states. Cities connected have yellow plates and uh, on the table and center. The outcome of the 2022 Forum of Mayors will be reported to both the UNEC Regional Forum on Sustainable Development and the Committee on Urban Development, Housing and Land Management. I'd like to express our gratitude to the Rapporteur of the Second Forum of Mayors, Ms. Uh, Josiane Ley, uh, Mayor of Evian Le Bain, uh, who, will re, uh, who, who will be reporting the outcomes of the session to the UNEC Regional Forum on Sustainable Development. This year, the forum is being held back to back with the UNEC Regional Forum on Sustainable Development that will uh, take place on 6 to 7 April, as mandated by the UNEC Executive Committee's decision document ECE slash EX slash 2020 slash L16. The second part of the committee's 83rd session will be held on 3 to 6 of October 2022 in San Marino. And I thank um, the uh, delegation of San Marino for having um, hosted, um, that will be hosting the, uh, the, the 83rd um, session of the committee. And the provisional agenda is published on UNEC website. The only agenda item relevant to part one of the 83rd session is agenda item two or a uh, two on the second form of mayors. If there are no objections, I consider the agenda of part one of the meeting adopted. Then the agenda is adopted. No. Oh, yeah, sorry, I didn't see. Russian Federation has asked for the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Russian Federation is not objecting against the adoption of the um, agenda but we disassociate ourselves from this decision. We are concerned by the fact that the representatives of Russian municipalities were not given the opportunity to participate in the discussions of this forum and their invitation was uh, revoked. So we have no doubt that the Russian representatives would have been able to substantively contribute to the work of the forum. And we would like to recall that the forum was created upon the initiative of the Russian delegation at the UNEC session in 2019. And from our understanding, the forum has the potential to create an additional level to multilateral diplomacy and to provide direct dialogue between the heads of cities and uh, mun municipalities in the pan-European region. And there is still a chance for this. The forum can be a shining example of new diplomacy, as the Madam Executive Secretary mentioned. However, all of this only has sense if we have an inclusive event. The current politicization of this forum and the attempts to use this as a form of punishment and to exclude representatives of uh, municipalities from certain countries undermines this forum and can very have very harmful consequences for municipal cooperation within the UNECE and the future of the forum. So we think we have, we can assess this uh, forum as an, in terms of the revocation of uh, Russian representatives, we think that this is illegitimate. Thank you. Thank you, Russian Federation, for the statement. 
Uh, EU has requested for the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. We are very pleased to see so many mayors today, either physically or remotely. But as several speakers before me have noted, we could not, at the opening of this important forum, ignore the direct and indirect impact of the Russian Federation aggression on cities all across Europe. This is why I thank you, Mrs. Chair, for giving me the floor. Uh, and I will speak on behalf of the EU and its member states. Ukraine aligned with this statement. The EU and its member states condemn in the strongest possible terms Russia's unprovoked and unjustified act of aggression against Ukraine, which grossly violates international law and the UN Charter and undermines international security and stability. The EU demands that Russia immediately seizes its military actions, withdraws all its troops from the entire territory of Ukraine, and fully respects Ukraine's territorial integrity, sovereignty, and independence within its internationally recognized borders and abide by the UN General Assembly resolution titled Aggression Against Ukraine, supported by 141 states at the 11th Emergency Special Session. The EU and its member states wish to express the full solidarity with Ukraine, its mayors, and the Ukrainian people. We resolutely support Ukraine's inherent right of self-defense and the Ukrainian armed forces effort to defend Ukraine's territorial integrity and population in accordance to Article 51 of the UN Charter. The Russian Federation's unprovoked, unjustified, and premeditated military aggression against Ukraine has left countless cities in Ukraine, in particular Bucha, Chernihiv, Kharkiv, Kherson, Mariupol, Melitopol, Mykolaiv, Sumy, and Kyiv suburbs such as Brovary and Irpin devastated and paralyzed with damages that will take years to overcome. Civilians, mostly women and children, remain without shelter, without safety, and the increasing reports of children's rights abuses and violence against women are alarming. At all times, Russia must respect its obligation under international law, including international humanitarian and human rights law, including with respect to the protection of civilians, women and children, and the civilian infrastructures in Ukraine cities, such as hospitals, schools, and kindergartens. Russia also needs to stop its disinformation campaigns and cyber attacks. Today, this forum is designed for mayors to express themselves and to show their city's contribution in terms of strategic planning and implementation of the sustainable development goals. This platform allows the elected local representatives to exchange views and best practices. Thanks to this platform, we can express our solidarity with the Ukrainian cities under attack, the solidarity that is already visible in very concrete actions in cities all across Europe. I thank you. Thank you, representative of EU. And now I see United Kingdom and Ukraine. I don't know which was the first one. And uh, then followed by Fe uh, Russian Federation. And, and, and then I would uh, like to uh, remind delegation to restrict their interventions to matters within the mandate of the Committee on Urban Development, Housing and Land Management and the form of mayor's thematic session. Thank you. Yes, Ukrainian and then uh, United Kingdom and then Russian Federation. Thank you, Madam Chair. This delegation aligns itself with the statement of European Union just made. We stress on the full compliance with the United Nations resolution, aggression against Ukraine and the decision taken by an overwhelming majority of the UNEC member states at the 121st meeting of the Executive Committee. Madam Chair, we support the agenda of Forum of Mayors. And I wanted just to point one thing that the speakers already mentioned today. And this is the relevance that the international organizations 
have, especially in the moments of war and people suffering. Let us not to forget about it today, because tomorrow it can be too late for everyone. I thank you. Thank you, Ukrainian Federi um, um, delegation. Now I give the floor to United Kingdom. Thank you, Chair, and I'm pleased to see so many mayors from across the UNEC region here today. I will be brief. The United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland stands in solidarity with Ukraine and fully supports the statement of the European Union. We commend the heroic efforts of Ukrainian city and community leaders to protect their citizens in the face of Russia's aggression and stand united in condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine as a clear breach of international law and the UN Charter. That is all, thank you. Thank you, United Kingdom. Uh, Russian Federation, did you ask for the floor? Yeah, the floor is yours. My apologies, Russian Federation did not plan to speak on these issues during the forum. We have a consistent feeling that our colleagues are in the wrong room. These statements are not for this room. The forum of mayors is not for these statements, which is a better place in the Security Council. Such discussions are not going to be fruitful. I will simply say that we reject the allegations and accusations against us. We are implementing our right to self-defense. The special military operation in Ukraine is designed to put an end to Kiev's actions, their war against the residents of Donetsk and Lugansk, which has continued for eight years and has taken with the lives of 13,000 civilians. The Russian Federation is not striking communications infrastructure, peaceful infrastructure, or residential property. The allegations against us are cause distortions of reality. Russian troops have created humanitarian corridors. Medicine, food, and other material is being supplied. However, the nationalist forces in Ukraine are hiding behind the peaceful residents, using them as a human shield and doing everything that they can to increase the number of deaths amongst civilians, using schools, hospitals, and children's facilities as emplacements for military. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the, this uh, statement. And uh, I close here the discussion on this topic and we move to the session first, one uh, first session of the um, agenda of today, sustainable urban transport, shared mobility and safer road. And I invite the uh, moderator of this session, Mr. Tommaso Rossini, captain of the Castle San Marino, and Mr. Giampiero Bamagioni, that is at the same time a bureau member of, uh, from Italy. Speak. Okay. And first, I I'd like to give the floor to uh, our director of uh, division, Ms. Paula Deda, that will set the context. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning to everybody, and thank you for being here so numerous. Uh, well, uh, I'm given the floor for just three minutes to put uh, things in context. Of course, you all have seen the program, but you also know that the work of the steering committee of the forum and the work of all the cities around the table today is really to identify the linkages and the contribution of their work to the relevant SDGs, to the pandemic recovery, and of course, for the implementation of the Geneva Declaration of Mayors. So just uh, quickly a snapshot uh, this first panel will focus on sustainable transport, uh, shared mobility and safer roads. Uh, there are obvious links to SDG 
three on health, SDG seven on energy, SDG nine on resilient infrastructure, SDG 11 on sustainable transport systems and road safety. Uh, there are also strong links to our Geneva Declaration of Mayors, the ambitious climate action that is linked to this uh, to accelerate the transition to carbon neutrality, the transition to sustainable energy and sustainable urban transport. What are the essential elements of uh, safe and sustainable transport in a city. You have also heard part of this from our special envoy on road safety. People-centered transport systems, reducing the use of cars, increasing uh, the use of public transport and sharing economy through the use of apps and other modalities. Technology can help us a lot to have sustainable mobility in cities. And of course, in all that and underlining, and you will see it all in all the uh, panels uh, of the next two days is energy efficiency. There are also strong links with city planning, and this is the point that we want to stress as forum of mayors that designing transport system that address the daily needs of all citizens is crucial, and in, there should be an increased involvement of mayors in decision making processes related to the design of transport system. This is not always the case. Um, Last but not least, we have seen, of course, uh, the importance of sustainable transport systems during the pandemic. We are uh, definitely aiming at more pedestrian bicycle lanes, increasing the supply of public, public transport and new solutions for financing public transport. Over to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Paola, for setting the scene. And I want, I would like briefly to give some general information to all moderators that um, the mayors will be invited to take the floors um, based on the sequence that is in, in the program, and um, uh, which is not in alphabetical order, but has been discussed uh, during the last two months. Each mayor will be given eight minutes to deliver their, um, their presentation. Um, they will be alerted two minutes before uh, that the session is uh, that the, the time is uh, ending and co moderator will summarize the main issues that were discussed or presented by mayors. And the floor will be open to discussion at the end if we will have time. We are running out of time, so I would like moderators to keep an eye on timing. Thank you. So now the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Hello, everybody. I'm Tommaso Lucini from San Marino, the, the city of San Marino. So we can start with this uh, forum here with my colleague, uh, Gian Piero Bambagioni. And uh, I give the floor to uh, Mr. Rasha Sarjman, Major of Yerevan, Armenia. I think he's online. It's my honor and distance, pleasure to talk of mayor this year and address you today. We, we meet when the world continues its fight against an unprecedented humanitarian and uh, socioeconomic crisis caused by COVID-19 pandemic, which has affected every nation's health and livelihoods, with the most vulnerable suffering the most. Deliberation in the framework of the Forum of Mayors offers a good opportunity to reflect upon the achievements so far and to thoroughly discuss the existing challenges and our collective efforts aimed at shaping the ways to getting back on track towards the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. In this regard, the them of the forum this year. Recovering from COVID-19 while advancing the implementation of SDGs could not be more timely and really relevant. Ladies and gentlemen, in leading the effective post-COVID re recovery and building back better while ensuring that no one is left behind the 2030 agenda remains as relevant as ever. Armenia is committed to pursuing the goals specified by the 2013 agenda. 
and the government has launched efforts to include the SDG in Armenian sectors reform, as well as nationalize and localize them in national strategies and policy papers. The municipality of Yerevan has implemented, implemented a wide range of reforms to achieve sustainable development uh, goal 11, thus contri contributing to Armenian implementation of the 2030 agenda. This includes the series of complex environmental health safe, uh, safety related efforts aimed to, at making the city sustainable, inclusive, secure, and universally accessible. The capital city of Armenia, Yerevan, is center of ma many economic, educational, and social achievements, having a territory of 227 square kilometers. It is a home to more than 1.2 million inhabitants, which consti uh, constitutes a 34% of the population of Armenia. In addition, based on the steep upshoring up in the past decade in the citizens, income and purchasing power, as well as the development of commercial achievements, there has been a significant increase in uh, private car ownership and housing development in the city. This has led to intensified congestions, road safety and air pollution problems in our city, as well as parking and public transport defini definitions. Moreover, the effects of COVID-19 pandemic on the decrease of the public transport readership and shifting of many citizens to pri private car has not yet been reversed completely. In order to tackle all of, of the above mentioned problems, the concept of sustainable urban transport development in our city is, is pursued through various strategic uh, police projects. There are different fields involved in, in this matter, such as urban development, road constructions, public transportation, and traffic management. Any policy and strategy development and implement in these fields must be compliance with environmental and human health protection requirements. The sustainable transportation systems uh, should ensure efficient use of scarce resources in case of Yerevan, the roads are considered to be one of the most important aspects. In this regard, increasing the attractiveness, reliability, and efficiency of the public transport has become an essential priority for the municipality of Yerevan. In the recent years, and it being pers uh, pursued through various projects, as fewer people use personal vehicles, the lower is the level of traffic con congestion and demand for new roadways. This city's vision is to provide the best possible uh, public transportation system for our citizens and is reliable, clean and comfortable so that it can be more attractive compared to the private cars for the majority of citizens. Some of the act activities in this sphere include purchasing more than two, uh, 200 new CNG buses and minibuses with plans to renew the trolley bus network through lens to uh, public transport and the introduction of an integrated electronic ticketing system. A sustainable transportation system also requires provision of a public trans transit system that provides good uh, con connections with the primary activity arrays. In this re respect, the project for development of new public transport net network based on different bus sizes, such as arti articulated 18 meter buses for the core routes down to minibuses for the feeder and local routes has been worked on during the, the past year in collaboration with international and local specialists. Uh, furthermore, the cons uh, construction of new bus depots and new control center also so started to ensure the serviceability and efficiency use of the fleet. One of the most, one of the most critical and ex 
explicit aspects of sustainable urban transportation is the air pollution problem. In addition to the strategic po uh, policies and project of shifting the priority choice of the citizens to the public transport, the city of Yerevan has also started various projects to improve to, uh, the mobility management and safety of the traffic flows across the city. Uh, to accomplish better mobility and flow around the city, various roads, highway, and bridge construction projects have been implemented in the recent year. One of this, the projects, which is its final phase, is the construction of Yerevan Belt Highway that aims to prevent the interest, interstate transit flows from impairing the city. In the sphere of traffic management, the city has already started in the construction of its new traffic control center to manage the traffic flows more efficiently, reduce the response time of the road authorities and emergency services and enforce the rules and regulation more efficiently. In addition, there are currently underground studies conducted by our specialists to implement intelligent traffic control system and adaptive traffic lights to reduce congestion and to ultimately lower air pollution. Furthermore, since personal vehicles are responsible for most of the air pollution in the city of Yerevan in collaboration with international donors, the municipality has acquired new and modern air quality assessment sensor, which will be used in various stations around the city to have a brighter, cleaner picture and evalu evaluation of the toxic gas and fine parties emissions and to ex execute controlling measure if necessary. Finally, in terms of having safer roads for both the drivers and pedestrians, we have executed a significant number of street lighting projects in the past year with more energy efficient LED lighting fixtures, fixtures which we, we believe, besides the tremendous cost reduction, will ultimately reduce the carbon footprint and enhance the sustainable for the city as well. Also, more than 150 pedestrian crossing around the city have been equipped with a harsh bottom traffic lights and proper lighting leading to the significant decrease in pedestrian morality rates. Does not only having a sustainable transportation system for the city of the Yerevan is very important, but it has been embedded in, very po in every policy and decision that we make these days. Since we believe that access of affordable, efficient, and reliable transportation for everyone is a key to improved health, education, and social empowerment of our citizens and our future generation. A sustainable transportation system may also work as a catalyst in the development process. A city with the sustainable transport system can easily attract new businesses and other activities. Hence, the benefits of having a sustainable transportation system are not limited to miti mitigated traffic congestion and improving air quality only, but it also helps to reduce poverty and bri uh, brings economic prospect prosperity to the cities. Uh, thank you. Thank you to the mayor of Yerevan. Thank you for sharing your experience and your vision. Um, now uh, uh, I give the floor to Mr. Andrea Basilaia, Deputy Mayor of Tbil Tbilisi, Georgia. Please. From the podium. Uh, just, just a reminder, I'm sorry, because the opening took some more time than it was foreseen. So kindly, if it is possible to shorten a bit the presentation, just to keep in time, because after that, we would, wouldn't be able to take all the presentations. Thank you very much. And I apologize okay. for that.
That's it. All right. That's okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, hello. And uh, uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity uh, to be in front of you and to be able to tell you about some of the projects that we have uh, started uh, in the city of Tbilisi. Uh, we, we are talking about um, transport system today and we're talking about the issues that uh, I think uh, all cities are facing to some extent and Tbilisi has not been an exception. We have about uh, 600 uh, private vehicles registered in the city and this number uh, has been rising by about six, seven percent each year. Uh, so we're really facing a, a, a slow time bomb, so to say, uh, and uh, we've kept come to realization that at some point it will be pretty much impossible to, to get across the city. So what we did is, uh, of course, we uh, took a systemic approach. Uh, we are now almost done working on the sustainable urban mobility plan, which will be a first for the, for the region. Uh, and uh, what we have decided is to uh, change the way we, we approach infrastructure projects and uh, uh, which has definitely meant that we will be doing less projects because they will be more expensive, they will be taking more time, but uh, I think the result uh, will be uh, that the city will, will change and as, uh, as mayors we know that uh, and the people that are running the city we know that you cannot, uh, you know, you cannot uh, tackle all the problems uh, at the same time, you cannot redo all the streets in the city at the same time. So our approach has been to shift uh, from uh, the way cities, uh, the streets have been designed uh, and uh, shift away from uh, designing the streets uh, that, that, and making it as, as, as comfortable as possible to use public transportation. Uh, one of the main avenues in the, in the city, Chavchavadze Avenue, uh, was the focus of a pilot project that um, really showed some promising results. Uh, the streets have been completely redesigned uh, using universal design. And the focus was shifted from the car owners to the uh, public transportation, to dedicated bike lanes, to ex extended sidewalks. Uh, and uh, I'll be honest, the, the initial public uh, response was not uh, so uh, it wasn't well received, let me just say it like this. Uh, the car uh, owners were very angry and then it took them a lot more to get to the work or whatever they're going using the car. Uh, but uh, of course our aim was not to please the car owners. Our aim, our aim was to really change the behavior, uh, which is very hard at the beginning, uh, but the results uh, spoke for themselves. Uh, and now it is the main avenue uh, that was done, uh, the public pro uh, project was done. Uh, it's, it's it, was, it was about 22 minutes uh, to ride the transportation from one end to another. Now it takes about eight minutes. Uh, and this is about three times as fast as it would take you uh, to, to drive through the same avenue with, the, with your car. So the, the idea is that we extend this uh, approach to all other streets. Uh, and uh, well, as I mentioned, this will mean that we'll be doing less uh, works, less uh, completed projects, but the projects that we, will, we, we do complete will have a much bigger impact uh, as, uh, as we aim to change, uh, as I said, the behavior of our citizens, which is probably the hardest because people don't want to uh, change the way they go to work. They don't want to um, change the way they drop off this, the kids at school, et cetera. But, uh, realize that it's very important. Uh, and uh, in the city of Tbilisi, we've pretty much come to the conclusion that there is no alternative to this uh, universal uh, design. There is no alternative to uh, better public transportation and the drive towards less uh, cars and more mobility that is being done by bikes, by, by, by pedestrians, uh, and by new modes of uh, eco-friendly eco transportation uh, that are being introduced in the city. Uh, another approach that we have taken is, of course, uh, another issue, the main major outstanding issue that this is fa facing, uh, as was mentioned by Yerevan and the other cities, the pollution, the air pollution is, of course, a major issue. And we are committed to introducing new green spaces alongside our infrastructure projects 
Uh, and this, again, this means that the project becomes more expensive. It takes more time, but at the end, it's not just a road project. At the end, you have this full uh, urban transformation uh, with additional sidewalks, with additional uh, extended pedestrian areas, and of course, new green spaces created uh, as part of the transformation. Uh, bike lanes, that's something uh, very new to, to the city of Tbilisi. We, we pretty much had no, no bike lanes about five years back. And uh, now we are up to uh, about 30 kilometers of bike lanes and uh, we're almost done working on the bike uh, master plan for the city, which means additional uh, 100 kilometers of bike lanes throughout the next couple of years. So to summarize, uh, while it's been uh, uh, quite hard, uh, to, to make these changes, to introduce uh, the systemic changes. Uh, I think that's the only way forward. And we'll be looking uh, at the way other cities have uh, faced the similar problem, but uh, we firmly believe that the only way forward is uh, through change in behavior and the change in the way we perceive mobility for our cities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Andre. Uh, we give the floor to the mayor of Utrecht, uh, Mrs. Sharon Dixjama. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I think. Uh, that we can all agree that we are living in dark times at the moment. The consequences of the war in Ukraine and especially the images that came to us yesterday from Bucha are horrifying. And I will not say this only as a mayor, but also as a mother. And I think that it makes me, it makes it difficult for me to start with a cheerful and optimistic uh, image of my city, Utrecht, but I will do so. Uh, if you look above me, you will see the single. And that is a five kilometer long canal that has uh, flowed around the historic city center of Utrecht for centuries. This is paradise in the middle of the city center. And if you are ever in Utrecht, and if you would be grumpy, which I can hardly imagine, take a walk along the city uh, and the single and you will immediately recover. And that first image will make you, I think, a lot more positive than this picture, what you see right now above me. Yet, this is exactly the same location only a few years ago. This 12-lane highway ran through the middle of our city for decades. Why? Because in the 1950s, we thought we really needed this highway because more people bought a car and the shops, businesses, and restaurants had to be easily accessible. So part of our ancient single canal was filled up. Water gave way to asphalt. And do you think that all the people who were living in Utrecht at that time were happy with this change? No, of course they were not. The COVID pandemic is and was a terrible time, also in Utrecht. But luckily, we were able to celebrate something big in my city during that period, because in 2020, the water returned to the single. Goodbye highway and welcome canal, greenery and healthy air. Also a radical change, but this time it was a positive one. The transformation of the single is not just a one-off project. It is an important part of the urban development strategy that the city of Utrecht chose years ago, called Healthy Urban Living. With this vision, we decided that the health and well-being of our residents and of our environment should be become the starting point for all of our actions in designing and developing our city. And as you know, that cities are not always the healthiest places on earth. Many people live here with uh, countless transport movements, mass production, etc. And it therefore makes sense that cities have the responsibility to come up with the solutions for a sustainable, climate-proof and healthy 
um, uh, um, future, because I think that health is a right for all of us. In Utrecht, we believe that the quickest way to achieve this is by investing in active mobility and the radical greening of our city. To put it short, less cars, more trees. This vision means that as a city, we sometimes need to take bold decisions, as Jean Todt also uh, mentioned. Decisions that seem unpopular at first. For instance, we take away parking spots and people sometimes cannot park in front of their houses anymore. But almost every time we go through with these plans, we see that people end up happier before uh, than before because they realize that they have more space to meet and for instance, for children also more space to play. And even business owners realize that walkers and cyclers passing their shops bring in a lot more money than cars passing by. Of course, taking away cars from the city also means that we need to provide our inhabitants with alternatives. And therefore, I want to show you some few examples. Uh, heavily invest in biking structure. I'm proud to say that we are in Utrecht, I think the absolute front runners worldwide in this. We continually improve the bicycle path network all over the city so that you can easily uh, and quickly cycle in the city from one side to another. And if you have an e-bike, you don't need a car anymore. Obviously, we have a big problem with all those cars, where, uh, of bikes, I'm sorry, where to put them. And there we found a great solution uh, to this problem. Because if you look at the next picture, you will see the biggest bicycle parking lot in the world. And we opened it a few years ago and it has place for 12 and a half thousand bikes, including more than 1000 sharing bikes. Last subject that would be focusing on active mobility and also have the realism that you know that not everybody will abandon the car. So if it's still there, let it at, at least be uh, more green and, and more clean. So we have uh, the most loading stations uh, for cars in the Netherlands, and we launched an extensive car sharing system in our urban development. And oh, there goes Utrecht. <laughs> um, and uh, what we also do, uh, and that you can see on the picture behind me, is that we built the largest uh, parking garage in the world with bi-directional charging stations, um, uh, which a uh, roof that consists entirely of solar panels. So um, I think that this is also some uh, unique project. To conclude, um, I want to come back to why we are all here today. Uh, we are talking about uh, urban resilience in times of crisis and pandemics. And I would like to stress that uh, for Utrecht, our focus on health and well-being uh, has proved uh, uh, and has proven that uh, it has an uh, effective, um, uh, it is an effective mean in uh, combating both crises. And um, we have kept investing in greening our city improving air quality and also encouraging uh, people uh, to move. And this makes our city uh, more uh, sustainable at the one hand and our residents also more healthy uh, uh, on the other hand. And I call this actually a double uh, win. So my mes message today to you is that it is uh, worth um, uh, to stick to your course uh, and even in times of crisis, or maybe I would say, especially in times of crisis, you should do that. And I have learned uh, that uh, our cities are the real drivers of change. Uh, we provide solutions to climate change. We protect and care for inhabitants in times of pandemics. And we provide shelter from refugees fleeing from war. Let's stay on course. Let's keep pushing this positive change forward together. Uh, thank you, and you're welcome to uh, come to visit my beautiful city. Thank you very much. Thank you to the mayor of Utrecht, an example of a very sustainable city. Now I give the floor to Tommaso Rossini, captain of the castle San Marino. Please, the floor is yours. Hello again. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. So, um, 
the project I bring here today is a two project from all one the first is from all the Republic of San Marino because uh, maybe as you know my little castle is a really little castle just uh, two kilometers square and with 4,000 uh, residents so the first is uh, um, um, a project between Rimini and San Marino Rimini's neighbor from San Marino I show you. So in 1932, a railway network was built to link San Marino with Rimini. The tracks were crossed by a white and blue electric train, and it consisted of an electric engine and three passenger vehicles. In case of necessity, also freight vehicles. The journey from San Marino to Rimini took about an hour. <clears throat> from San Marino people, it was very important link, both for those who wanted to reach the Rimini's Riviera, and for the many who left to go to abroad to work abroad. In the Samarino territory, the railway was crossing uh, 17 tunnels to obviate the slope that was too high to the electric motor. During, during the Second World War, these tunnels became safe haven for more than 100,000 displaced people. In fact, the Republic of San Marino hosts the people from neighboring municipalities during the bombing. Unfortunately, in 1944, bombings interrupted the railway line. And in the hand of Sisi, this, this was definitely closed and replaced from Rimini San Marino Highway that crossway, crossed it. The railway has remained in the heart of San Marino people. And over the years, also thanks to the tenacious work of the session Treno Bianca Azzurra, some sections have been rearranged and adapted to cycle pedestrian routes. Some tunnels have also been reopened. And in 2014, one of the three engines of the train, which remained inside a tunnel for over 70 years, was unhurted um, and restored. Now it makes uh, a fun show of itself in the entrance of our historic center. This is where the project for the construction of a secret path starts, ca characterized as a new type of connection between Rimini and the Republic of San Marino, which constitutes constitute a, a very important ambitious cooperation project between the neighboring real realities. The same cycle path will be able to open up to new tourist scenarios, connecting two areas already with a strong holiday vacation. The cycle path project will open a series of unexplored potential that can give a new life of this area. The tank vision focuses on innovation, on eco sustainability, on the enrichment of specialities. The main objective of this project is to create a fast and environment sustainability connection between San Marino and Rimini for electric bicycles or similar with great landscape scenic appeal. As far as possible, the path will follow the route of the whole railway site with a total length of 31 kilometer and an estimated journey time of just over an hour. Leaving from Rimini, it will be flat and then in the San Marino territory, it will reach higher, but always accessible slopes. Great attention will be paid on innovation thanks to the involvement as part of the project, the University of Republic of San Marino and Rimini. Another objective it will be makes this part the, uh, the venue for experimenting and test driving, site for the new for prototypes of environmentally friendly vehicles, paying maximum attention to the issue of smart mobility. But we have um, yeah, another project uh, in, uh, in my castle and this is the urban regeneration. Yeah, because um, mm, uh, after several years, uh, uh, we came to manage, uh, finally, we came to manage uh, the area we call the ex Tiravola, uh, which was uh, used for six skit shooting. This area is surrounded by greenery and one side, the white side there is a wooded area with roll and, pitch and pitches, once used as a campsite. 
On the other side, there is a large flat green lawn, about 2,000 uh, square meter. Overlooked by a massive building composed by several rooms, a, refresh, a refreshment point, and some shed warehouse. Consider all points discussed before, there everything is perfect to host a project sustainable for the need of a different target group and ages. The project we want to realize is to set up a youth aggregation center, a multifunctional space where young people from 10 to 30 years old can meet up and develop new skill and knowledge together interact with each, with each other through educational, cultural, and recreational activities. A free opportunity for aggregation, sports, school support, workshops, and expressive activities. The space will be therefore dedicated to study rooms, music re rehearsal rooms, craft of multimedia, workshops, gyms, soccer field, volleyball, and other sports that will be required. The historical moment we are living in with the growth of the social network that increased the isolation of young people is creating a society always more individualistic, incapable of a personal relationship. We know that there is a strong relationship between loneliness and depression in young people, both in the immediate and long term. There are more and more episodes as self-harm, alcohol, and drug abuse by adolescents, and surely one of the causes is that one. For that region, it's now necessary having space in which take place group activities that stimulate cre creativity and sharing. It would be managed in synergy with the association and citizen, citizen no profit, but with the only social purpose, a co-creation formula that we have to call the subject, institutions, companies, and citizens, today responsibilities, especially towards the most delicate segment of the population. The main thing for the right path of the project will be the involvement and participation from the earliest stage of conception of young people to whom it's mainly addressed. Every step must be an expression of the needs of, the, of this generation. Create the necessary responsibility and the respect toward a structure that must belong to everyone. We believe that this area is strategic to create also new tourist, touristic offer, enrich the outdoor activities, strengthen the, strengthen the track trials network and establish a new way of staying. Special staying like glamping, but also traditional stays with camper or tents. Tourists could find here a strategic point given its proximity to the historical center. It's connecting through the trials and the, its location surrounded by greenery. Another very important aspect of the for the community will be the redevelopment of the park area, attended by residents and patrons, both to enjoy nature and to practice sport. In fact, this is a major starting point of the para paragliding and beautiful mountain biking and hiking trail. There are already a bocce court and skating rink, and we want to improve the sport facilities and outdoor gym and skating rink. Of course, making it usable also by associations, sport federation, and school from educational projects. All these activities are an important aspect of a healthy life and uh, in the open air and meeting people, practices that help people to live better and that are considered preventive activities to stay healthy as contained in the WHO guideline. For us, this green area will be increasingly crucial to overcome the last period marked by the COVID pandemic. Thank you very much for your attention. And I yeah. salute. Th salute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rossini. And thank you to San Marino, an historical city that looks the future. Now, the next, uh, next speaker um, uh, is connecting from Norway. Uh, Mr. Morten Walden, Chief Executive Tordheim. Please, the floor is yours.
First of all, thank you for the opportunity to have this presentation. Trondheim is the Norwegian capital of technology located in central Norway and has about 200,000 inhabitants. In 2019, Trondheim was awarded the status of Geneva UN Charter of Excellence on SDG City Transition by UNEC. The same year, the Center for Sustainable Development, the Bærekraft Center, was established. Its role is to develop innovative methodologies, approaches, and solutions to implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, including developing guidelines, standards, and reports, multi-stakeholders, cross-sectoral partnerships, and network relationships, reinforcing a whole system for transformation. The core of what we do is about sustainable value creation. We work with systemic approaches and documentation of the work in a voluntary local review. We work with large-scale system innovation, and I'd like to mention now that we host an annual conference just now in June 2022. We work together with UNEC on implementing a joint project, improved sustainability on 17 Norwegian cities, and collaborate with other inter international institutions and organizations, most notably the International Telecommunications Union, ITU, who carried out the U4SSC verification in Trondheim, also UN Habitat and others. As a part of this, we have established a national network for sustainability in collaboration with other cities and county authorities in Norway. Trondheim is one of the capitals of innovation in Europe. In 2019, recognized as the most innovative city in Norway by the Ministry of Local Government and Modernization. The city is home to many academic institutions and research centers, including the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, NTNU, the largest technical university in Norway, and the well-known research organization, SINTEF. Trondheim has been developing steadily over the last decade and has ensured that its economic growth is coupled with environmental sustainability and that it translates into the benefits for local communities, businesses, and supports public sector modernization. As a part of this, we have established a close collaboration with Norway's largest university, and through the University City Agreement, Trondheim 3.0, we work hard to come up with better services and city solutions within all sectors like health, education, culture, and city transition and development. Trondheim has successfully mainstreamed SDGs into its policies and strategies, programs, projects, and partnerships. Trondheim has established a target to become net zero in relation to its operations by 2030 and to reduce by 80% the overall greenhouse gas emissions. And over the last years, Trondheim set up ambitious transport objectives to digitize the access to transport services, to diversify the mobility offer, to green public transport and help businesses increase their value creation. In the course of the next four years, the city will invest over 10 billion Norwegian kroner in delivering sustainable infrastructure and services especially in relation to energy, transport, and mobility. New picture, please. Trondheim developed and is the owner of an online platform and an application for shared mobility called Mobi, which aims to contribute to moving the mobility in the municipality from personal car use to shared green and public transportation. Mobi provides live information about all shared transportation options in the city, like shared vehicles, bus, scooter, bicycles, and indicates how far they are located. Mobi was developed in the context of the city exchange project, where Trondheim is a lead partner. Currently, almost half of the travels in the city are carried out using environmentally friendly modes of transport, such as electric buses, powered with renewable energy. New picture, please. The Center for Sustainable Development organized a Mobi scavenger hunt. The students taking part in the hunt were asked to use the Mobi application to move from one place to another in the city 
and to take photos in front of various shared mobility options, like e-scooter, shared bike, a bus, uh, in landmark places in Trondheim. At the picture, you can see students testing Mobi application in front of Powerhouse, the first energy positive building in Trondheim. New picture, please. In Trondheim, energy comes from renewable sources. The municipality works towards developing and implementing circular city solutions in relation to energy production and consumption. Being a partner in the positive city change project under the horizon 2020, Trondheim has developed a practical approach to become energy positive, which means cities produce more clean energy than they consume. It uh, includes developing positive energy districts and technological support, enabling its efficient functioning, including two-way chargers that optimize the use of energy and enable, enable charging both electric vehicles and given an energy to the grid. This photo demonstrates the practical use of this two-way charger. Last but not least, Trondheim developed the SDG City Transition Framework in 2020, also known as the Bold City Vision, which provides tools and guidelines that support planning for positive energy blocks and was awarded by the Euro European Commission as one of the most innovative solutions developed by EU funds. Thanks to this, Trondheim is on the course to meeting local and the EU climate goals and putting it in practice ways to energy solutions. New picture, please. In uh, Trondheim, we work closely with public and private sector partners, civil society organizations and citizens. It includes especially students. We thank to our internship program at the Comune in the Center for Sustainable Development can support the development of innovative solutions in the field of transport and mobility and sustainable production and consumption. Since 2021, the students have worked closely with IKEA under the SDG clinic in the Center for Sustainable Development. They have organized workshops to discuss IKEA's commitment to sustainability and their commuting needs and patterns in Trondheim with a view to support the development of local shared mobility hubs. This photo was taken in the Trondheim Commune from one of the workshops with IKEA and includes students, the student coordinator and the representatives of IKEA. So this was my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Morten Walden. Now we left the floor to Mrs. Fatma Shain, Major of Gaziantep, Turkey. Hep yüksek belediye başkanı Türkiye'de. Ben öncelikle forumu hazırlayan, bizi bir araya getiren değerli başkana, değerli çalışma arkadaşlarına şahsım, şehrim Gaziantep ve ülkem Türkiye olarak saygı ve hürmetlerimi sunuyorum. Firstly, I would like to thank to Mr. Chair and his colleagues for bringing us together on behalf of myself, my municipality and people of Gaziantep. OECD Şampiyon Şehirler İnisiyatifine davet edilen bir şehrin belediye başkanıyım. Uh, I am a mayor of OECD Champion Mayors League. Uh, Londra'da uh, Avrupa İmar Kalkınma Bankası'nın Yeşilşehir Belediye Başkanı inisiyatifine davet edilmiş belediye başkanıyım. I am also a mayor who is invited to London by EBRD within the context of Green City Initiative. Bunu nasıl yaptık? Bunu sizlerle paylaşmak istiyorum. And I would like to share how we did it. 2014 yılında Gaziantep Büyükşehir Belediye Başkanı olunca İmar Master Planı, Ulaşım Master Planı ve İklim Master Planı birlikte yaptık. When I was elected in 2014 as the Metropolitan Mayor of Gaziantep, we have established our Development Master Plan, Transportation Master Plan and Environment Master Plan. 
E, o sırada tabii e, bugün e, Kiev'in çocuklarının yaşadığı e, sorunlar daha başlamamıştı. Maalesef biz Polonya'nın bugün yaşadığının çok daha fazlasını kendi şehrimizde ve kendi ülkemizde yaşadık. Yalnızca bu şehirde şu anda 500 bin mülteci var. Bunun büyük bir çoğunluğu kadın ve çocuk. And surely at that time uh, the uh, suffering of Kiev children have not started hadn't started uh, and uh, the situation in Poland was not uh, like this at that time however in uh, the past in that time in our city we had lots of refugees and even now we have uh, more than 500,000 refugees and most of uh, whom were women and children the Gaziantep modeli oluşturduk we have created a Gaziantep model e, kapsayıcı olmak, hiç kimseyi geride bırakmadan, hiçbir ayrımcılık yapmadan, herkesle birlikte yol gitmek için çalışmalara başladık. Uh, we have created an inclusive plan with the motto of leave no one behind and with no discrimination. We have started our plans with uh, by taking action with all of those people. Bu üç planın sonunda özellikle sürdürülebilir kalkınmada e, akıllı şehirlerde, e, güvenli şehirlerde ve yeşil şehirlerden önemli kısmının ulaşım olduğunu biliyoruz. Uh, and while developing those uh, three plans, especially in sustainable development, uh, we, uh, we are quite knowledgeable that transportation is uh, one of the most important things in intelligent uh, cities, sustainable cities and green cities. Akıllı ulaşımda 2017 yılında başlatmış olduğumuz çalışmayı sonuçlandırdık. Engelliler dahil olmak üzere yüksek teknolojiyi ve yüksek yazılımı kullanarak e, bunun pandemideki sonucunu aldık. Pandemide toplu taşımayı güvenli hale dönüştürdük. And indeed in intelligent transportation uh, we have collected all the information and including uh, people with disabilities we have created uh, a system with the support of technology and softwares during the pandemic uh, we turned our transportation into a safe transportation bisiklet ve bisiklet yolları artık çok daha önemli hale gelmişti çünkü bisiklet artık bir spor aracı değil bir zorunlu ulaşım aracı haline dönüştü Uh, and also back in that time, bicycle lanes uh, gained quite importance because it wasn't just a sports activity, it was uh, a mandatory transportation mean. E mobilite ve eskoturları da sisteme dahil ettik. We have included uh, e-mobility and e-scooters into the system. Ulaşımda özellikle tramvayla birlikte metroyu stratejik planlamasını tamamladık ve hükümetimize yatırım programına alınacak hale dönüştürdük. Uh, in the transportation we have created plans for trams and subways uh, and we turned all those plans into uh, a model which would be included into investment plan by our central government. Bu yılın sonunda yeni 25 kilometrelik Gaziray hattımız hayata geçecek. At the end of this year uh, a new 25 kilometer uh, length Gaziray system will be integrated into the transportation of city. Yeşil ulaşım burada çok önemliydi. Uh, green transportation was hugely important. Otobüslerimizin hepsini yaşlarını, filomuzu gençleştirdik. Uh, we have uh, renewed our, our fleet uh, in terms of uh, buses. CNG'li otobüslere geçtik. Uh, we started to use CNG buses. Elektrikli otobüslere geçmek için de denemeler yapıyoruz. Uh, and now we, we are having trial activities uh, to uh, have e-buses in our system. Özellikle enerjide yenilenebilir enerji bizim için en önemli başlıktı. Uh, especially uh, when it comes to energy, renewable energy was uh, the most important title for us. Tükettiğimiz bütün enerjinin iki katını Güneş enerjisine dönüştürecek projeyi tamamladık. Uh, we have completed the project which will uh, turn the consumed energies uh, double uh, into uh, the uh, solar uh, energy. Bu da EBRD'ye özellikle çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Çok yakın çalıştık. 
e, OECD'ye ve Şampiyon Şehirler İnisiyatifine çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Hem Birleşmiş Milletler'in hem Avrupa Birliği'nin birçok kuruluşuyla çok sıkı çalıştık. Uh, at this point, I would like to thank uh, to e EBRD for their close cooperation. And at that period, we have collaborated closely with OECD Champion Marriage Initiative, uh, UN uh, institutions, and EU institutions. Burada en büyük sorun planlama ile birlikte uygulamada finansal yeni yatırımlara finansal destek bulmak gerekiyor. Uh, the most uh, important thing here is that while having those uh, plannings, uh, we need to find a financial uh, investment support. Bunun için Londra'da yaptığımız toplantıda uh, özellikle yeşil tahvil dediğimiz uh, sukuk sistemi yeni bir alternatif finansal model olarak karşımızda. Uh, and uh, for that matter, actually during uh, our meeting in London, uh, we have been introduced with the green bonds, which could be a new alternative to these investments. Hükümetimiz Paris Anlaşması'nı hızlı bir şekilde imzaladı. Our government have uh, signed uh, the Paris Agreement. Uh, Parlamento'dan geçirdi. Uh, it has been already ratified in the parliament. Çevre Bakanlığı'nın ismi değiştirildi. Uh, our Ministry uh, of uh, Environment has a new name now. Buna uygun iklim kanunu ve su kanunu hazırlanıyor. Uh, and in line with all those developments, there will be uh, a new uh, amended uh, environment and water law. Gaziantep Büyükşehir olarak. As Gaziantep Metropolitan Municipality. Sürdürülebilir kalkınmada. Uh, in the matter of sustainable development. İnsani ve çevresel kalkınmanın her türlü gereğini yapmak için bütün planlamalarımızı yaptık, projelerimizi tamamladık ve bu konuda bütün dünyaya örnek bir model oluşturduk. For the humanitarian and environmental development, we have prepared all of our projects and plans, which will be a model to the whole world. Bu coğrafyada kendi kendine yetmenin pandemide ne kadar önemli olduğunu gördük. Uh, we have noticed that how important is it to be self-sufficient in this geography. Özellikle ulaşımda, especially in transportation, güvenli ulaşım, safe transportation, güvenli şehir için çok önemli bir başlık oldu. Uh, is a crucial uh, topic for safe cities. Bu coğrafyada dirençli ve dayanıklı bir şehir olmak için büyük bir gayret gösterdik. Uh, and we have put all of our efforts to be a resilient and safe city in this geography. Bunu bir kalkınma modeline dönüştürdük. We turned those efforts into a development model. Çocuk dostu, genç dostu, kadın dostu nasıl çalışılacak insanı merkeze alan bir çalışma yaptık. Uh, we have created our plans, uh, putting uh, humans into the center and identifying uh, child-friendly, youth-friendly and women-friendly approaches. Özellikle son yaptığımız genç kart ve kadın kart uygulamasında. Uh, especially in our last uh, efforts uh, called youth card and women card. Toplu taşımayı teşvik ediyoruz. Uh, we are encouraging public transportation. Toplu taşımayı kullananlara da seyahat indirimi getiriyoruz. Uh, and we are introducing uh, discounts for the ones who are using public transportation. Uh, şu anda bu yapılan çalışmadan uh, gençlerin büyük bir çoğunluğu uh, sisteme girdi uh, ve kendi bireysel araçlarından çıkıp toplu taşımayı kullanacak uh, çalışmanın uh, uygulamasına dahil oldular. Uh, and indeed now, uh, majority of uh, youth uh, have been introduced uh, to the system. They are now integrated into public transportation. Uh, they are abandoning their private cars and being a part of public transportation. Aynı zamanda Türkiye Belediyeler Birliği Başkanıyım. Uh, I am also the chair of uh, Union of Turkish uh, Municipalities. Türkiye'deki bütün belediye başkanlarına fikir projeleri açıkladık. Uh, we have uh, announced uh, those uh, idea projects to the old mayors in Turkey. Akıllı ulaşım, smart transportation, uh, temiz ulaşım, clean transportation, yeşil şehir, green cities. Başlıklarında fikir projeleri yarışmaları açtık. Uh, are our topics for the uh, competition for those projects? Ödüllendirdik ve mali destek verdik. 
Indeed, we have awarded the winners and we have provided financial support to the winners. Bugünkü toplantının sonunda özellikle çıkan çıktı da belediyelerin yapmak istediği konularda mutlaka alternatif finansal desteklerin e, güçlü bir şekilde verilmesi gerektiğini görüyorum. Uh, and indeed at the end of uh, today's uh, outcomes, uh, I do see that alternative financial uh, means should be integrated into the system. Çünkü çok zaman kaybettik. Because we have lost uh, so much time. Hız, hızlanmamız lazım. We need to see... Dünyayı bir buçuk derece daha fazla ısıtırsak. Uh, if the global warming is really strange, kindly to finalize the presentation because we are running out of time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to the mayor of Graziantep for sharing activities on sustainable urban development. Now, the next speaker is connecting from Sierra Leone. Uh, uh, I give the floor to Miss uh, to uh, Madame uh, Yvonne Denise Eki Sauer, Mayor of Freetown. The floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. Um, our context is very different to the context that most of you have descri have described. Um, we are working in a city which has seen. A population explosion of from 500,000 people to 1.5 million people in a period of just under 30 years, um, and this has happened without development control and with very limited resources. So our approach um, is reflective of that and reflective of the challenges. The challenges, as I've said, starting from rapid urbanization, but not ending there. Um, that rapid urbanization, the absence of infrastructure and development control has meant that the economy has not grown in tandem, that street trading has become a feature of the city, that low occupancy vehicles have um, dominated the, the landscape. And although 80% of the population of the city use public transport, those, those vehicles are low occupancy. So um, in the first slide, you will see the city council building. Am I meant to operate my slides myself? Um, in the first slide, you'll see the city council building um, showing an, just the area within which the city, the, the city hall is. I, I noticed the slides aren't up. Um, I believe the organizers are sharing this. We are looking into it, into this now. So just hold on with us for a second. The images are up now. You can proceed, thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Um, this is this is Freetown City Council, um, which sits in the middle of our central business district. And as I was explaining, the challenges that we are facing in respect to transportation is uh, actually stems from um, a combination of a huge population explosion. Um, but then that is then compounded by a lack of development control um, and a lack of growth, really of the city so that then translates into a range of including including um traffic which you'll see on on the next slide um where as i've mentioned although 80 percent as you'll see on the next slide so am i am i controlling the slides or is somebody doing that the slides are on. Go ahead. Right. Can we go back to the previous slide? Right. So in, in addressing these challenges, addressing the fact that we've got um, the, 
a lot of challenges with the, the structure of the streets, um, with access to green space, we've taken a two pronged approach. Um, firstly, recognizing the need for improved walkability, um, improved greening, um, and improved parking. We have embarked on a program which, with which we are partnering with the city of Zurich, um, with them providing the funding for this to do a regeneration of the central business district. So you see the zones there. Um, we are starting with zone one, which is where the city hall uh, is located. And we are extending, widening the pavements. We are bringing in more green spaces and we're bringing in solar lighting. Um, but that on, in, its, in and of itself will not address the main challenge, but it will be significant in terms of restructuring this part of the city to attract business and to make it more of what it used to be prior to this huge growth and population that we see, um, which is the hub of business activity in the city. If you move to the next slide, I'll begin to talk about the second approach, which is addressing the massive traffic congestion. This, unfortunately, is what you see now in zone two. And as I mentioned before, it's a combination of public transport, but public transport, which is unhealthy because 33% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from these low occupancy vehicles, a combination of pura pura, uh, which are the minibuses, of tuk-tuks or kakes, which are the three wheelers, and okadas, which are the two wheelers. If you go to the next slide. Good, if you can go to, yeah. So on a typical day, you will see that combination. This is this is more, this is within at the other end of the, the um, CBD um, with, within the zone two, where you can see more clearly the taxis, the, the, the pura puras, the tuk tuks. And I think what's really, what's really important for us is that although you have public transport, public transport isn't the answer if it's not mass transit. And that takes us then to the next slide. where we are introducing for the first time ever a mass transit system, a cable car system, which will have three lines. Um, and we will start with the pilot on the Eastern route, which is the line in purple, um, the, the, the line in red rather. Um, this will move from a situation which we've had previously where one of the buses that you saw would carry 130 people. Um, one of the minibuses, 200 people. One of the kekes, yeah. you would need 2,000 of them in order to move um, the same number of people that you would move with one cable car, um, which is 6,000 per hour. Our, our, with the pilot line is 3.6 kilometers. Um, we've actually made significant progress in the funding for this. Um, we've just completed a, a due diligence, pre-due diligence mission with uh, C40 City Finance, Finance Facility, facility which, which now to us, to us to go, go secure funding, funding for the full of full as a whole. Um, this is a 39 euro, 39 million, 39 million, euro, million euro project uh, in the scheme of in things. the scheme of things. So when I when I listen to previous speakers, um, um, the, the budgets talk about here really are minute and yet the impact will be transformational so we'll be moving six thousand people in an hour um, we will reduce our greenhouse gas um, emissions which means not huge numbers from a global perspective but from the perspective of local health um, reduction in respiratory diseases and stuff it will be really significant. Uh, what is really sad, I think, as we listen to all the presentations, is the fact that for the want of very small amounts of money, we have significant scale. Um, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking to see the deaths in Ukraine from the war. It's also important to note the thousands of deaths that happen every day from populations in our parts of the world because of lack of access to the resources required to improve transportation. Deaths on the road are higher um, because of the poor safety record. These two interventions, the CBD regeneration project with widening 
with bringing in cultural part. And of course, course, the the mass transit people car will actually actually save save lives. lives. But at that point in time, I'd like to say a big thank you to the city of Zurich for making 2.5 million euros available for the CBD regeneration. Um, And as we move forward, looking for funding for the cable car, I'd like to highlight how the lack of funding and access to fund access to funding in many parts of the world contribute to continued debts. But the project is here. We are moving forward. We're hopeful and expectant that because we have a, the found firm foundation and, and a really good feasibility, that this funding will be accessed. Um, and this funding will actually lead to lower costs, not just in terms of Please come to an end because we are running out of time. Thank you. Because of the practical reduction in travel costs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Yvonne. Now we give the floor to Mr. Mahabi Nga, Mayor of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, Your Excellencies, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. A very good day to one and all. On behalf of Malaysia, permit me to extend my appreciation to the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe for the kind invitation. Indeed, I am pleased to be here amongst mayors from leading cities around the world to share about Colombo's efforts in advancing towards the Sustainable Development Goals, or in short, SDGs, specifically through improved mobility and safer road. Allow me to begin with a brief look on our beloved capital city, Kuala Lumpur, or in short, KL. Our fair city has come a long way since it started as a tin mining center in the 19th century. Since then, Colombo has experienced rapid development, flourishing into a thriving city spanning 243 square kilometers, more than just home to a growing population of 1.8 million. Colombo has experienced monumental changes, particularly in terms of its infrastructure. Today, the city continues to evolve while we welcome the growth of our beloved city, this continuous process has not been without its fair share of challenges. Like all cities worldwide, urban challenges have shaped our city. Indeed, a rising population coupled with climate change have brought about a number of urban issues, including traffic congestion, road accidents and extreme weather conditions. This of course has been compounded by complications from the COVID-19 pandemic over the past two years. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in line with the aspirations of the 2030 agenda for sustainable development, Colombo City Hall strives to create a world-class sustainable livable, resilient, safe, and inclusive city for all. Importantly, we are committed to keeping our promise that no one will be left behind. As the capital city of Malaysia and the heart of our nation's economic development, the booming population of Kuala Lumpur has resulted in a significant increase in private car ownership and usage in the city. As a result, Colombo undeniably faces the issue of traffic congestion. May I kindly draw your attention to the image that we have on the screen. This was captured. This was captured last Monday from one of our CCTV. The previous, uh, I mean, the previous uh, picture. 
the image pictures the daily root ah this is the one the image pictures the daily routine of many of us are facing in Kuala Lumpur during peak hours. Can we go back to the next picture, please? Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, while we have a distance to go, I am pleased to note that Kuala Lumpur is well equipped with transportation network that has helped reduce traffic congestion within the city. Our diversified rail network provides residents with a variety of services, including the light rapid transit, mass rapid transit, monorail, and commuter services. More importantly, by providing this alternative, we are encouraging KLIs to opt for a greener mode of daily transport that is also convenient. To further improve connectivity, we are introducing dedicated lanes for buses in the city to promote the public to use the public transport. In addition to this, these buses are all equipped with fleet trackers to allow the passengers to locate the arrival of the buses, reduce waiting time, and of course, to plan their journey. Consequently, we have incorporated a new cycling lane, or as you can see from the picture, the blue lane and pedestrian network into the city as shown on the screen. Next picture, please. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, to encourage further usage of public transportation, we have established a more comprehensive and integrated public transportation network through first mile and last mile feeder services, as well as park and ride facilities. As you can see on the screen, that is the some of the park and ride facility that we have got in Kuala Lumpur. Next picture, please. As part of our first mile and last mile feeder services, we are driving forward zero emission transportation as a viable option for residents. As you can see in the photo shown on the screen, we have upgraded our free ride go KL period service to electric buses. This is in line with our mission to become a carbon neutral city by 2050. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at the present moment, the, mobile, the model share for public transportation in Kuala Lumpur is 25%. As we strive to work harder, we have established a special task force in order to achieve a 70% model split for public transportation transport by 2040. I have full confidence the establishment of this task force will improve the percentage of model split for public transport in Kuala Lumpur. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as a conclusion, despite the numerous efforts that have been discussed earlier, I believe Kuala Lumpur needs to do more. We will continue to explore solutions to traffic management and adopt more technical advancement as tools to support our initiatives. Besides that, it is imperative to find more funding to build more park and ride facilities in the city. In addition to that, a provision of a complete network for pedestrians and cyclists is crucial in order to create a holistic mobility system in Kuala Lumpur. As mayor of Kuala Lumpur, I would like to emphasize that we are firm in our commitment to get more people to use public transport to achieve our targeted model split of 70% by 2040. And of course, these efforts are in line with the 2030 agenda of the Sustainable Development Goals. With that, thank you very much for the time. I hope that this has been a beneficial session for all. Thank you. Thank, thank you to the mayor of, of the capital city of Malaysia.
Um, the next speaker is connecting from the United States. Uh, Madame Michelle Vu, Mayor of Boston, please, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, I'm Mayor Michelle Wu, representing the City of Boston in the United States, and I am so honored to take part in today's Mayor's Forum. There's a saying in the US that goes, there's no such thing as a free lunch. The idea being that nothing is ever really truly free, because if it's free for one person or a particular group of people, then another person or group must be paying for it, either with their time, their money, their labor. Like many sayings, there is truth to this. Our resources are finite. Our challenges are complex. And rarely, if ever, do solutions exist without some sort of important trade-off. But too often, we fail to recognize the hidden costs that fund so many of our essential public goods. So, no free lunch, but what about a free ride? When the pandemic hit in Boston, we saw an opportunity to do more than just adapt to continue serving our residents in the ways we always had we saw an opportunity to actively take steps to address existing inequities that the pandemic had been deepening. With the virus surging, many white collar subway and commuter rail riders were able to transition smoothly into working from home remotely. Boston's essential workers, however, continued to rely heavily on public transit to keep our city running. In May, 2021, a bus traveled down Warren Street as it left Nubian Station one of Boston's busiest bus terminals. Before the pandemic, a study found that black bus riders in Boston, such as many of the riders on this very bus, spent on average 64 more hours per year on buses than white passengers. And we know that 75% of our city's transportation, greenhouse gas emissions, about one and a half million metric tons, come from vehicles. And so as every bus, running through communities of color with more delayed routes, more congested traffic, longer exchanges and stops added up to emissions as well in our communities and health concerns in our, for our residents. In response to this and in response to the ongoing pandemic and with an eye toward addressing some of these disparities in commuter experiences, we asked what it would look like to reimagine public transit as a true public good. We know that transportation at its core is about connection. It's how our residents connect with healthcare, education, economic opportunity, and each other. If as a city, we hope to make real progress in closing the racial wealth gap, advancing climate justice, and empowering our communities, we know that transit is one of the very best places to start. So we decided to explore free bus fares, by eliminating the financial barrier for riders, by making buses free to our commuters. We hoped this would put money back in people's pockets, encourage riders to come back to transit, and stabilize bus travel times and reliability in the face of increasing traffic and congestion. As a city, we selected the Route 28, the highest ridership bus route that runs exclusively within Boston for our first fare-free pilot. pilot. true public good. We know that transportation at its core is about connection. It's how our residents connect with healthcare, education, economic opportunity, and each other. If, as a city, we hope to make real progress in closing the racial wealth gap, advancing climate justice, and empowering our communities, we know that transit is one of the very best places to start. So we decided to explore free bus fares by eliminating the financial barrier for riders, by making buses free to our commuters. We hoped this would put money back in people's pockets, encourage riders to come back to transit, 
and stabilize bus travel times and reliability in the face of increasing traffic and congestion. As a city, we selected the Route 28, the highest ridership bus route that runs exclusively within Boston for our first fare-free pilot. pilot. Um, Madame Michel Wu, I think that your uh, video has a problem because it uh, stops and repeats, starts repeating the same sequence. And now we have lost you. We don't have any more connection with you. I think that you have the the moderator has to resume since the um, um, Madam from uh, Mayor of uh, Boston has a problem with connection. So I think we finalize here and uh, okay. you resume. Okay. Thanks, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Michelle Fu. Has the the chair, the Madam Chair, said that there is uh, some problem with the connection, so we can um, we can close this uh, part of intervention and uh, we open floor of discussion. If there are anybody who want to, So the, if there is nobody who wants to in, in, intervene, there is nobody intervene. Um, we, I, I thanks a lot for uh, this opportunity to be here in um, the place of commodorator. And uh, I'd like to remember you the next appointment uh, in uh, my Republic of San Marino, if I can't, <laughs> I like my invite for you and uh, everybody. Uh, so um, in autumn, and uh, we have the 83rd session of uh, UNIC in the city of San Marino. So I, I'm glad to invite you all the, the present and all the non-present online uh, member to visit uh, our city and to come to the, other, to the next uh, session of uh, UNIC. Thank you very much also to my colleague, uh, Gian Piero Monvagioni. Thank you, everybody, also from my side. Thank you. Well, thank you also to moderators and to all the mayors that presented here today from the region and from outside the region. Uh, the messages that were delivered today, they will be compiled and reported to the um, uh, 83rd committee session. Now, I'd like to inform you about the two side events that are going in parallel now at 13.15 uh, to 14.45, so 1.15 to um, uh, quarter to three. Uh, one is local resilience to climate change and COVID-19, no, no one left behind in urban resilience buildings at Geneva City Hub, Villa Rigo. Uh, to go to the Villa Rigo, you have to go out from the main entrance of the Palais the one that has the, the flags and then take uh, on your left. It's a old 
nice historical building that um, uh, is very inviting. So the one is there and the other one is the side event of UEFA uh, called Football as Acceler Accelerator of Change. It was also mentioned before by the representative of UEFA. It will take place at the mezzanine. If you go out, you see the signs uh, in the e-building at the ground floor, UNEC will be signing a memorandum of understanding with UEFA and talk about their future work together. The Champions League trophy and the Women's Euro trophy are on display there, and you have the opportunity to take picture, pictures with, um, with, with, with it. So I, I close here the uh, first session of uh, this part of uh, the Forum of Mayors. And I expect you to come back at three o'clock in the afternoon for the second session. Thank you very much.